I obviously forgot to send you a calendar invite. <laughs> I like your hat. <laughs> oh, that's a, a a friend of mine, Vlad Sabov. He used to be. Uh, he used to write for The Verge. Moved to Japan uh, just before the pandemic and uh, sent me that hat. That's cool, and the T-shirt as well. I've got I've got gear in. Yeah, there. that's. Yeah. <laughs> I think in the past 12 months, I bought more t-shirts than I ever bought because, you know, like I would see an, an ad on Instagram or something like, oh, that's a cool t-shirt. I mean, I have nothing else to spend my money on. So I <laughs> yeah, I wanna, exactly. That's the... <laughs> I bought all these stupid t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's already recording. Uh, look, uh, as I said, guys, uh, I might edit or not at, at, at times. So it is unfair to Alex because he's jumping into the call. It's already recording. <laughs> he's not sure when it's starting. So we're going to do something because I don't want to add music. I mean, I've, 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 I've created something. So uh -oh. there's going to be a call to say, to say that uh, uh, from that moment on, it's recording and watch out what you're saying because everything that we say is being recorded and that will be the call in let me try to make that work i just want to tell you both good luck we're all counting on you <laughs> <laughs> so that's from that moment on every time we record an episode that will be the point where for sure it's being on air i like that i like that. i feel <laughs> that uh, adds a little bit of production value <laughs> yes exactly uh we had so much great feedback that's really cool right it was nice it was it was so lovely that people were genuinely excited to have the show back yeah i i thought people like kind of dropped out honestly yeah because yeah, <laughs> it had been over a year and i can understand where people have you know swiped to get rid of the podcast on their podcast app and they're not waiting for any any updates totally understandable but gosh thank you guys for uh yes. for for continuing to listen and also taking the time to get in touch on both, both private, privately and publicly. Yeah, they did. I, I didn't. As I said, I, I didn't really read everything, but I saw that on Instagram there was a lot of of, of nice comments, and as well on on Twitter. Uh, the uh, <laughs> I, it seemed that we timed it well because I counted at least five messages from people saying, "Hey." I'm about to take my first flight in a year, so that's great that you released a podcast. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people seem to be doing that, which is which is encouraging. I mean, geez, you go to the US and everybody and their grandmother's traveling, but I think <laughs> for us here in the UK, and I, of course, I would imagine uh, in a lot of countries all over the world, it's it, you know you're starting to emerge from from our cocoons and. You're Go shaving. back to what we love. You're a guy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh my god! I mean, I, I, you can't see it here, but my hair is ridiculous. Uh, I yeah. spotted this morning. You you put something on Instagram uh, for probably what should be an upcoming episode of Attaché of You in a bar, probably in London somewhere, and you're looking at Greg, and I was like. What the hell has happened with his hair? You have like rock star long hair now, which looks really cool, by the way. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he could pull it off. Uh, he, well, I mean, the great thing about that episode is that Greg is in front of the camera for this episode. Yeah, exactly. And not You're behind both next it. to each other, right? Yeah, so, so yes, at the very least, tune in when it comes out, hopefully later this month, to see uh, Greg's hair. <laughs> and yours. And mine. Yours. Yeah, we, 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 yes, we do look like a little, uh, like a 90s hair band. It's, uh... <laughs> uh, uh, we also had, that's one I caught, Rico sent us a picture of him in an empty Swiss flight. I think he was flying from Zurich to Charles de Gaulle, uh, showing us that he was listening to the podcast. Yeah, that's, that's great. That's so cool. I love Good pictures Rico. like that. And of course, it being Rico makes it even more special. Exactly. So uh, if for those with context, Rico is an old-time friend, and I introduced him to Alex when Alex recorded Attaché in Zurich, because he lives in Zurich, and he's the one who did you a little bit of a yeah. tour. And you were eating those sausages, I think. Wonderful. <laughs> yes, eating sausages and drinking beer. I mean, we, we had a great time, <laughs> thanks to Rico. That, that sounds like sci-fi, like eating out sausages, actually. Uh, uh, we also, uh, I also did just one look at the 
the stats just the day after we released and we had a lot of uh countries when we started ranking at number one so thank you guys this is one new actually malaysia i don't think we ever ranked number one in malaysia so thank you guys in malaysia i can't wait to go back to kl actually i was just and thinking about malaysia a couple of days ago and you know, with Singapore tantalizingly on our green list, but obviously inaccessible to outsiders, <laughs> it was the biggest tease ever. I, I uh, yeah, want we, we'll to come to that there. list later. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah, it's. I mean, actually, Singapore uh, has just increased its quarantine from fourteen to twenty-one days. Twenty-one days 21. in a hotel. In a exactly, which I think Hong Kong was already doing twenty-one, but they're now thinking to getting that down to seven if you're double jabbed. But I mean, still seven. That <laughs> I'm, seems I'm looking at that yeah, I, I don't even know. I don't even know how long that's sustainable for, for the city, for any city that has such such strict measures. But oh gosh, because I'm the Hong Kong, I, I, I want to visit for so many reasons and it just looks impossible right now. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So, um... Yes, so as I said in the last episode, we're recording this like like cinema verite, you know, truth cinema. That was a, a movement that was born in, I think, in France in the 60s or something. And I think 2021 is a perfect timing for reinvention. We're doing podcast verite now. If we burp, we burp. But it's too early for to, to get a beer. Um, so we're not going to burp, probably. <laughs> we're recording, because we didn't say that last time. We're recording this on the 12th of May, 2021 which means it's going to be released on the 12th of May 2021, because as I said, I'm not going to do any edits, mostly, most likely not any. Uh, it, it's actually very liberating, man, to do that like this, because then I don't have to overthink this. We just run with it, and it works. I you could caught actually... me by surprise even, you know, when, I, when we had recorded that morning, and then people messaged me saying, hey, it's great to hear you're back. I was like, oh, wow, okay. I didn't know it was, it was coming out today. That's exciting. <laughs> yeah, I think it just makes it... So it, it could mean, but I'm not going to do it, it could mean that I could record even more than every two weeks, because obviously if we do it like that, I mean, there's no lots lots of work to be done. But I mean, we still... I mean, we could. Well, let's see what happens. And by the way, that's exactly this the, the, the this episode as well. Let's see what happens. I have taken this time a few notes, just like pointers to remember stuff that I wanted to say. And But we'll see. Again, it could be half an hour, but I don't think so. It could be two hours, more likely, actually, as always with no, us. Yes, yeah. <laughs> we also had a cool comments out of the ones I've seen on Instagram under the last one about the new logo. So thank you guys. Oh yeah, that's so cool. You have to tell the story about that. Yeah, well, first I just wanted to make a new logo because after a year I thought, yeah, it's kind of a new chapter. We kind of have to do something different. And also I wanted something a bit fun, I guess. Uh, something that is more energetic and fun like travel should be. And at first I started, I love Saul Bass, you know, mm -hmm. or uh, he's the guy who designed, I mean, just Google it, guys. He designed like um, posters for movies, like The Shining and stuff, uh, hand-drawn. So I'm, I'm really bad at hand drawings so if it was a computer. So at first, the first iterations were very kind of we knew, actually, photorealistic. And then I said, ah. So then I got influenced by Mad Men or Archer. I know oh, you love Archer. Archer. <laughs> yeah. Love Archer. <laughs> and I tried many iterations, and then I ended up doing this one, which is, uh, no, I kind of like it because it's I a do bit, too, it's, and it's gone down very well. People seem yeah. to be very uh, happy with the it. The only thing I didn't realize that I realized after I posted it, and I think I told you, is like the coloring that I ended up choosing kind of makes, you know, the red kind of makes it like look like Emirates, <laughs> which is really not intentional. <laughs> well, there you go. Subconscious <laughs> homage to Emirates. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but I haven't decided on having any music, though, for like we all have in podcasts. Uh, so I, I still think it's kind of cool to have an intro music at some point. Uh, I, and whilst I'm bad at party tricks, uh, maybe uh, a trick for the podcast. Like here could be one music we could use. Dude, that, <laughs> that song... <laughs> oh my god I got no that's not the one because that's it's copyrighted the... man. <laughs> yeah but that's okay let's see how long we can get away with it for man man i, I i'm producing these other podcasts for a venture capital firm and uh the, 
the guy I'm coasting with is a huge fan of 80s pop music and he absolutely wanted to get an actual song and he got us you, you know that better than me because you have content ID on YouTube and all these stuff that copyright songs <sighs> and he got us the <laughs> Johnny, Johnny hates jazz. I don't want to be a hero because he happens to know, I think, the cousin of someone who was in the band and they just happened to re-record a song from 1986 and we got the rights to play it in a podcast. So that was Whoa. cool. But they also taught me that it's really hard to clear that Spotify especially because I think Spotify kind of runs uh, Content ID or something like that. So Yeah, that's... I, I'm not I, sure, to be honest. I don't... People keep trying to crack this nut for for licensing and all of that stuff, but it's such a money maker for the rights holders. And you know, you can, I guess in a way you can see that. But at the same time, yeah, it's a bitch. I hate it. So I ended up choosing something like this, and that will be our song, perhaps. So maybe I'll change my mind for the next one. Let's see if you like it. <laughs> Nodding his head. I like it. <laughs> I like it the a cool lot. The cool thing is that we can we can do it live, so we can like like you know TV TV shows. We can talk over it. Yeah, yeah. Oh no, I like that. Very, very Archer. Yeah, exact, exact. I thought about you. I heard that, and I'm like, this is for this is for Alex. And again, because flying and traveling should be fun and er, energetic. Yeah. So anyway, uh, I'll, enough I'll bagpipes make- in that though. I need more. <laughs> I may, I may play it. I have a longer version. I have multiple versions of that. Maybe I want to close the show as well. We'll see. So um, this is episode 109. Uh, last one, we didn't announce it, was WFH, which is not WTF. <laughs> <laughs> that means working from home, guys. This one, I decided not to name it yet because we'll see if we where we end up getting. I have an idea which one could it be, but I'll announce it at the end. If we don't reach the end, it could be maybe one of the airports uh, Alex hit just recently because he, he just traveled. This is going to be one of the questions I'm going to ask him. Uh, I know and I got a bonus airport on my trip too. An oh. unplanned bonus airport. Yeah. So that's the other thing we started, we decided to do. I'm not, I usually would ask Alex everything about his trip before the recording. So, you know, on WhatsApp whilst he was traveling. This time I told him, just send me a picture of the window so that I can kind of live vicariously through you. <laughs> but I don't want to know anything. So then I'll have the, the surprise. So I didn't know that. Uh, by the way, was it a, a Dreamliner, I think? Yes. Did I recognize that right? Yeah, at least, at least I got that right. I'm not that off travel yet. But, you know, let's start with one thing. Uh, let's talk airlines, and then we'll go to your travel. So, do you know? Do you play Scrabble, Alex? Yeah. Oh, I I don't play a lot. Do you know the reverse Scrabble strategy? <laughs> it's a it's a strategy that's made in jest. You know, when you're about to lose, when you tried everything, you know, in Scrabble, for those who don't know Scrabble, you're supposed to, and I'm going to simplify it. I'm sure Alex knows much better than me this. You're supposed to put like the longer words possible because you get more points if you have longer words. Correct. Longer words right. and, and unusual letter combinations, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so the reverse Scrabble strategy is to say, well, I'm about to lose. I'm going to, you know, completely upset the other, the opponent, by doing something that makes no sense. I'm going to go for a very short word that gets no points. And it's, it's known in the airline circles. I think it's, it's, a, it's a strategy derived from Euro White. So you remove A-L and L-I-A, and from Alitalia, you end up at Ita. That's the new name of Alitalia. <laughs> Is it really? I missed that. You're, are you serious? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, they tried everything. They, you remember, they read it, the airline 27 times, and basically they read it the exact same airline every time. And of course, it fails because if you try to say mistake every time. So this time they say, well, we're going to do the same airline, but we're going to remove letters and it's going to call, it's going to be called ITA. <laughs> That's like lipstick on a pig, right? It, Unless you're fundamentally changing how the airline is run, then, you know, I look forward to us talking about ITA in the past tense. <laughs> I think it stands for Italia Trasporti Aere. Uh, I'm a really bad Italian, man. I, I can speak Spanish, but Italian. Uh, or it could be because we know that every single airline has an acronym. ITA could be, it's a terrible airline. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm really sorry so, for my Italian friends. <laughs> is it? Does it exist? Is it flying? No. So apparently, I, I, I've read uh, contradictory comments in the past this. month. It was supposed to be launched 
this coming summer. So it's, you know, another revamp, another let's put the depth in the garbage and let's restart the airline. At first, they said it's going to be a smaller one, like they say every time. And over time, it creeped up to be basically the same airline as before. And now there's even word that it could not change name. I honestly don't know. But honestly, man, don't you think that Italy deserve a proper, nice airline? I mean, the north of Italy, on because we, we like to joke about Italy. Italy is probably my favorite country in Europe. But the north of Italy is probably in the top three richest region in Europe. They yeah. deserve to have it's a proper It's very airline. strange. I thought that... Air Italy, which was Meridiana, and yeah. it was the Etihad right? group yeah. based. Yeah. No, no, it was Qatar. Qatar, yeah, okay, so that's why it didn't work. Uh, attempt to re to revitalize it and create a a, a flagship competitor to Alitalia, or at least e even something to replace it, because this is when Alitalia was was really on the brink, and I thought. You know, you see them rock up in all over North America, Chicago, San Francisco, LA, and then they just disappeared. Yeah, and that was a real shame. So you're right. I think uh, Italy has been has been hard done by. Yeah, but they deserve it. they deserve it. Yeah. So let's give them good luck. I hope that this time they get it right after getting it wrong for so many times, they're getting in bankruptcy and getting all over again. But they deserve to have a proper airline. So I hope this time it works. Uh, they will save uh, some money on the painting and probably on uh, the fuel because, you know, a few letters less on every single aircraft. <laughs> <laughs> I wish them well. I wish them well for the reasons we just talked about. And also it's about damn time. Uh one thing we never settled because it was our <laughs> our debate before we stopped recording the race result since we just talked about Alitalia which one would be first to die or to be renewed Alitalia the 737 Max or Berlin Airport so basically they're all here now they're all yeah <laughs> i you know what i i i think i was l most surprised by Berlin Airport as in? As in that it, it actually is working and functional and <laughs> opened. Because it happened very quickly. Like, there was this announcement, it was at the end of last year, right? That, they, that, that yeah, it's going to happen. And then it was the same as it had always been. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, sure, dude. And then, like, two <laughs> weeks later, first flights land at Berlin. Oh, wow, okay. And so far, like, we've heard nothing about it, which I can only take as a good sign. Uh, yeah, but then again, there's not, there mustn't be a lot of flights flying there because we're still in the middle of the pandemic. Yeah. So <laughs> of course well, I mean, it works. What a great, what a great time to, to start at an airport operation when you it's got a very, very soft start. Yeah. And for a long year of soft starting. Yeah. No, it started, I think it was it October or November. Yeah. I mean, I've heard good things. I don't know. Let's see. Let's see. I, I don't know when I'm going to go back to Berlin, but, um, I mean, they deserve, it sits next to, uh, Schoenfeld. Right? Yeah. Yeah, so, and maybe this whole pandemic will have, because, you know, they wanted at some point, let's keep some terminals at Schoenfeld open. There was also that talks of keeping airport. <laughs> Tegel open, but Tegel is closed. So I think it's going to be only Berlin, B-E-R. B -E -R. So let's see, but yeah. Uh, and what about the Max? The Max is back. I don't think you've flown it since it's come back. No, have in you? fact, when I... Uh the flight I just took or flights I just took, I was, I was quietly hoping that I would be on one, but actually there, there aren't that many still. And, and a lot of the airlines are very slowly bringing them back into the, mm. into their fleets. Alaska's doing it incredibly slowly. Um, as it's the same with everybody else. And you, I guess you can understand why. Um, I think there's some, there's some training that still has to happen uh, for people particular systems um, that they, they've modified. So yeah, I, I I think I've changed my my stance on this. I think I would have actively avoided them in the past. Mm -hmm. um, but now I'm sort of quietly curious. Maybe I'm turning into a fatalist. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, no, I don't. Yeah, would have I? I mean, in Europe anyway, it's almost a moot point. Besides Ryanair and possibly KLM, kind of nobody flies even to th the, the three seven anyway. There's not the business case though, is there here compared no. to the US? No, no, not really. Uh, so it, it's 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 authorized in Europe. It's authorized in the US. It's authorized in parts of the world, but not everywhere yet. I think, for instance, India. 
only allows the Max to fly over its territory airspace, but not uh, yet to be used. I think I read something like that. But I mean, at the end of the day, it, it'd be clear everywhere. So, uh, And I think they need it, right? Because during this pandemic, if you think about Boeing versus Airbus, I think currently it, things will change. Boeing got the lesser hand because oh. they had the Max issues. They have the 777X delayed and delayed and delayed yeah they well on the other hand um airbus has the um, has all has had already killed the 380 before it was just timing maybe it was luck right it's interesting how when the 380 was launched because it was late that kind of sealed its fate if it had been launched probably 2006 it would have been a much more successful... I'm not saying that it would have still exist now because the program is dead, but it would have been a more successful aircraft, but it launched with a delay in 08 or 09, which meant it was right in the middle of the financial crisis, which meant a lot of people got cold feet and didn't order it. And But for the end, it's the opposite. They killed it. They killed the program before the pandemic. So on the books, at least, it's not a problem for Airbus because yeah. it was already wound down, uh, right? Yeah, and they've had the success of the 220 project, which yeah. is which has turned out to be a, a home run for them. And the 350 is performing well. I think it's never a good sign for... I mean, Boeing had the max, which was disastrous. People yeah. lost their lives, the 777X, as you said. And, and, and now to the point where long-time Boeing stalwarts like Cathay are canceling triple seven X orders and replacing them either with other Boeing aircraft or, or, or Airbus as well. And then you've got Tim Clark basically not, not bas literally telling them to get their SH one T together, sort their lives out because they're just, you know, that they, they need a fundamental restructuring and reevaluation as an organization. He was not pulling his punches because I think he's, he's probably exhausted all of his avenues for getting something done to resolve these production quality issues uh, on the Dreamliners, the delay in the 777X. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know what's going on there, but they need to fix it quickly. Otherwise, people will start to lose faith. Uh, I will clarify what I just said. It's let's be let's be clear. The the, the Dreamliner outsells the 350. The 350 is, is more expensive, and the Dreamliner. So it's a success. However, sure. Boeing historically has always relied more on long haul for its books than Airbus, which relies a lot on the 320 series, which 319, 320, 321, 321, LR, et etc., et cetera, which means that in a time where there's less long haul flights and of course less orders for those, of course Airbus is in a better position and they had killed a 380. They, they're selling some cool 330 Neos and like you just said, the 220 is extremely successful and Breeze, I think, Bought even more actually, or something like that. And the 321 XLR, which has no competition from Boeing, no. because kind of Boeing kind of gave up, it seems, on their middle market. Middle market, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> but at the same time, when you think about it, yeah, it's true that Tim Clark is complaining that the 777X is late. But don't you think it kind of also makes everyone happy that it's late because they don't want to have it now, and you know, because the, the numbers are so bad to have it delayed a bit? will make everybody happy which also could position air uh, sorry position boeing to be in a very good stance in two three four years down the line when suddenly everybody needs a very big aircraft again and that's a triple seven x yeah yeah um and not to jump the gun here but i i definitely saw this trend over the last year as, as i've been well, bouncing across the Atlantic, um, mm -hmm. but to a few, for, to multiple airports, you see the long haul strategy for all of these airlines in in their in their aircraft choices. It's it, it's yeah. it, there's been a huge consolidation. I mean, you know, you look at who is using what for what routes, and it's really it's the Dreamliner. And it's the 350. 50. That's the long haul yeah. weapon. Yeah. That's everybody's yeah. consolidated down to those two airplanes. Yeah. For ultra long haul, it's the triple seven. Yeah. So A and A, Qatar, the the backbone of their of their long haul flagship routes, triple seven, not the 380, nothing like that. But for mid to long range transatlantic, all you see is 
Dreamliners and uh, and 350s. Yeah, I think these two these two aircraft for the long haul will be what we see all over the world. I mean, of yeah. course, Emirates will keep the 380. We'll come to the 318 a bit. But I mean, at the end of the day, these are the two aircraft, which were already the two most modern aircraft. On yeah, they're each, they're efficient. Each, yeah. They're versatile. I think what we, we've probably touched on in 108 episodes p- to prior to this is that <laughs> what I think was so attractive, uh, you know, the, for both of those airplanes is that you can put them on a two hour flight, you can put them on a 14 hour flight and they're still efficient, you know? Yeah. Whereas the older generation, it it took getting to a certain distance, six plus hours before they actually turned a prop, they became, uh, you know, efficient. So in the pandemic with my little ADS-B receiver strapped to my window here, I will see, you know, a, a Virgin Atlantic Dreamliner doing Brussels, London. I'll see, you know, uh, BA doing Stuttgart, London and with with a 350 because they can still make money on those things even yeah, especially with cargo as well exactly yeah. exactly so that that it seems to be the sweet sweet spot which you know both have outstanding passenger exper- you know experience so I'm not complaining at all no no me neither uh, you you hinted at uh, Tim Clark talking about uh, production issues and you triggered a memory of. Uh, Al Baker, or Al Baker, who complained, who was refusing to accept any Dreamliner who was coming that was coming out of South, South Carolina. Carolina, and now basically th- South Carolina is the default. Uh, they, they closed. What was it? Renton was the name of the other um, yeah. production facility. Yeah, yeah, for- uh, Everett. Everett. So Rented basically, will I'm not sure that Al Baker he will he will have to change his stance because uh, if you want a Dreamliner now, it's going to be made in South Carolina full point, right? Yeah. So I just hope that they fix because we remember we had the what was it a ladder found in a wing or something. So I hope they could. Yeah, there were a lot, like I think the most prevalent. You know, there was the battery issue, which I, I I appreciate and understand and have sympathy for people that are innovating. Right. So you're you're yeah same. You're going to be able to get as much so far ahead of the game that there will be unforeseen things. Just no matter how much testing you do, and that was a victim of that. But then that's that's a design issue. What what Al Baker and all of these other detractors are talking or critics are are talking about is production quality. Yeah. So when you've got metal shavings found in electrical bays, which is obviously you don't need to be a genius to figure out that that's not a good thing. And that, (laughs) you know, and then there has to be an airworthiness directive put out saying, pull up your floors and look for metal shavings. That's a production quality issue. And that, yeah, that doesn't need to be airplanes. It could be electronics. It could be vehicles. It doesn't matter. That's a that's a company culture and process issue. Yeah, yeah. We 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 said that many times that Boeing has to look inwardly about reshaping a bit of culture. A lot of people point out. I don't know how true is that that it dates back from the move to the offices to Chicago. Chicago yeah, with the uh, integration um, of what was McDonnell. Uh, I don't know if that. I don't know. I I just hope you know we need manufacturers. We need that competition. No, and, you're uh, so you're right. Yeah. I think I think you know you re- you read some of these whistleblower accounts and the the theme is Boeing changed when it stopped was stopped being run by engineers and was yeah. run by Excel spreadsheets. Exactly. Ex- well, yeah, and also they were bringing in people from outside the airline industry yeah. to run it exactly on an Excel spreadsheet and. The engineering prowess and expertise was pushed further and further down the decision-making process, and the profit was was the holy grail. I mean, it's a it's a public company. That's that's unfortunately the way it happened. But you can't do that with an airplane necessarily, <laughs> yeah. right? As we saw, as we saw. I mean, the the the, the Max still has some issues with. I, I read that electrical wiring. I think so. There's been. Uh, a few other, but I think over time it'll be fine. I don't think people will really truly care. I mean, there's always like these articles like, "Will you refuse to?" But most people won't care. And I will. I will be like you. I'll go into a max without not thinking twice because, especially now that we had a pandemic, uh, the time has flown. Haha, <laughs> flown, and they're 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 fixing. I, I'm I'm not worried about about that, and I, I hope because for the moment. The Dreamliner and the Max are the two aircraft that make money for Boeing, and they need to make money because they're losing a shit ton of it. Yeah. I, I, we will not go into details because I haven't um, 
I haven't taken a list, and as I told you guys, I don't really take notes, but it's interesting how many small airlines, startup airlines are popping up yeah. right and, and left. And I'm wondering if it's because so many aircraft are still parked around, not being used or having left, you know, your leasing companies having too many aircrafts on their hands. And suddenly you get a better deal. So if you, Alex and I, we could finally start that layover as airline we always wanted to do, because suddenly you can find like cheap, maybe not latest generation, but cheap airlines. But I, I, I don't know if you've seen maybe in the US, like airlines you had never seen before, but I keep seeing every two days, like a new name of a new airline that starts somewhere, whether it's in the US, in Europe, in Asia. And I'm like, wow, right? Yeah. And it, it feels counterintuitive with the times we're living in. But then again, why not, right? Yeah, it's great, it's, the great companies are, are started in times of stress. Yeah, I, I definitely, I definitely have seen, I mean, I think we talked about it last episode around about the, um, some of the new transatlantic uh, airlines that, that are coming out of the ashes of Norwegian and, and Wizz Air, and, I mean, not Wizz Air, Wow, and all those guys. But yes, there's an airline in California that just started and it's going from like Burbank to Santa Rosa and then all these third tier airports in west of the Rockies. Uh, oh, yeah. I've, oh, something like that. Some, like I've, 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 yeah, I can't remember yeah. what it's called, but the guy, he, the CEO who, who has a strong, strong pedigree. He was, he was, I think, CFO of United for a while. I mean, there's no fool. Um, and obviously saw the opportunity there. He was saying, we got these, we got these 737s for pennies on the dollar, yeah. you know, a, a huge, you know, multi-million dollar discounts, uh, uh, from, from the companies that used to own them because their, their debtors want the money. So I, I think that that's good. Whether they'll last, who knows? I mean, Breeze, Breeze is pre-pandemic and they're, you know, a couple of weeks, if not, maybe a couple of months away from, from starting, but uh, the the airline enthusiast in me is very excited about this. The the <laughs> yeah, me too. The startup pessimist in me is like, well, good luck to you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, there'll probably be uh, quite a few failures, but a few will stay. So that's cool because we lost. You just mentioned it's true. We we didn't talk about it. Norwegian. Norwegian is basically an airline that does one route within Nor Norway. I'm exaggerating, but they stopped the entire international network. They let go of. I think all the Dreamliners, so mm -hmm. they went back to, I think they only have three sevens as well, but they have very few routes, no more money. They had some help from the government, but it was limited. I mean, it was limited. It, it's kind of hard because is Norwegian a flag carrier? Should they deserve money? It's so the whole debate people have been having for a year for every single company in the world, right? Mm. But basically they're not here anymore. I mean, and it's a bit sad because it was putting a lot of pressure in terms of competition, especially for us to go to the U.S., right? Yeah, they were they they were very competitive. They would do one way fares, which is unheard of across the yeah. the Atlantic. I flew on them half a dozen times long haul and was very impressed. They they had that that sweet spot. So yeah, it's you know we have JetBlue coming. Yeah, I guess I don't yeah. imminently yeah. right across the Atlantic. Yeah, I read York. June, but I mean, of course, it depends whenever. You know, probably they'll open the route. As in, the US is still uh, do not travel to the UK, and they're still supposedly uh, at least there's travel advisory. Uh, yeah. Which, by the way, it's a bit. You know, it dates from the time that the Alex Hunter variant was going on, and That's now you're like, yeah, we didn't have anything. Like I think yesterday there was not a single death out of right. the virus in the UK, meaning we're, we're doing pretty well. I mean, let's touch wood that it continues. Mm. So it seems a little bit, um, I think it will open pretty quickly, not open like like 2019, but open with you know some testing or whatever. I, I, I don't see why it wouldn't. Uh, it's between the, at least between the UK and, and the US, because like you said, I think you use that term, they're neck and neck in terms of vaccine campaign so yeah. I, I, it's doing pretty well anyway let's move on uh we'll go back to your travel in a bit um but because uh, i started with reverse scrabble strategy uh etihad could have tried that but if they had tried that etihad et all the aircraft would have called home so that doesn't go. work <laughs> or they could have gone for iha yeehaw but no <laughs> they went they went they went boutique you know what we're talking about all the time they're like our, their strategy was kind of, we're going boutique, but they were not really. They were still doing in kind of Emirates play, but so no more 380, like 
we know, like pretty much everyone has stopped using the, the, the 380, which by the way, it's sad. We will never be able to try the residence, Alex. <laughs> uh, yeah. But interestingly, no more 777 as, as well. They, they're giving up on the 777 to your point. They're only going to have Dreamliners and 350s. That's it. And that, they call it boutique. I don't know what it actually means in terms of size of the network. But, I mean, they have this big-ass airport with a new big-ass terminal, which I'm dying to see. So I hope they, they stick around. They probably got lots of help from the government anyway. So, yeah, boutique long haul, I guess, because if you have Dreamliners and 350s, let's see what happens. Yeah, I, there's, it's a weird one. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what they're going to do and, and, and how they can... They can. Come. I mean, they were at a knife's edge for a while there, anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> excuse me, and I, I think um, they've pulled back on a lot of their destinations. Um, I, although, funnily enough, for for completely different reasons, I was just looking at their destination list before we started recording. It's still pretty huge. It is. I mean, I, they've I pulled back from from places like San Francisco. Um, L.A. is seasonal. And that's where they were they were putting the three eighties and the triple sevens on, but uh, you know it, they're it, from a geographical footprint. It's mm -hmm. it's looking more. I mean, regional is underplaying the distances that they serve, but you can see them shrinking it in and then wrapping it around that strategy of the aircraft that they've decided to pin their future on. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll see. Um... No more three eighties then. So, uh, <laughs> let's start with our new number one country, Malaysia. Since guys, you you've been very nice yeah. to put us number one there. So, Malaysia just announced that they're just announced, which is strange because I thought they would have done like a long time ago that they're giving up on a three eighty. Yeah. Qatar Al Baker said we're giving it two years, so they're parked. They say if within two years traffic is not picking up like you know mass traffic we're also giving up on them uh ba interestingly s might put some back this summer to the us yeah you well interestingly <laughs> my return flight in august with my kids is at least now slated to be a dreamliner i mean a, a 380 oh wow See, so BA is not giving up, but you know, BA has a history of keeping like, you know, 747 for longer than everyone. So maybe they'll keep the 380 for longer than everyone. I hope Good. so. I mean, it's a nice aircraft. I'd like to fly it more, the 380, so I'm happy. Uh, Lufthansa is gone. At first they said, we're going to keep half of it. So they, they went to do this weird thing when they said um, the 747, I think would be in Frankfurt and the 380 in Munich. And they gave up on that as well. They kind of gave up on everything international for a while. So it's yeah. gone. Uh, they have no more, they, they're also giving up the 340. So they have, and also the old uh, 747. So I think they're only keeping the 800, uh, no, 8i, 8 international. Which I still have not flown. No, they, no, but they're keeping them. Yeah. Uh, so at least we'll get a chance to fly that. Korean and Asian uh, have given up on the 318. By the way, did I read that correctly? I think Korean and Asian are merging, merging right? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so probably we'll still have some also 747s dash eight there because Korean. That's where I've flown them. I've flown it also with Lufthansa. Uh, Qantas. I'm not sure what they're going to do with the 380. I, have, I, I didn't search for it, so Who of course knows? right now they're not Who knows flying what anything. Going to do period. <laughs> A and A at least will will still have their three nice looking you know super cute oh, for uh, Hawaii, three eighties, yeah. and uh, and of course Emirates because uh, and they're, they're 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 I think they're still expecting seven more so the 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 production lines are almost closed, but they're fitting the last seven or something like yeah, that. yeah I, th so, I think uh, that's right I think the last one has come out of manufacturing and they're all being fitted and tested and all of that. So at least I think, well, I mean, Emirates doesn't really have a choice. They cannot kill the 380, I mean, anyway, right? I mean, that's half of their fleet. Yeah, so uh, for sure, like we said before the pandemic, for sure, we'll be able to fly the 380. If you want to fly the 380, fly Emirates, which was already your best bet before. But pretty much everyone else, I'm, yeah, too too bad, too yeah. bad. Too bad. 340s, I think, do you like, yeah, I think you like the 340. Which one, the Dash 6? Uh, or you don't like it? I, I don't no, I don't, I'm not a huge fan of the 340. Yeah, me neither. So that one, I think, is also gone. I think I know. I don't think anyone flies it anymore. 
Oh, yeah, they do. In fact, one just popped up. Lufthansa still fly them. No. I just it, one just flew over my house yesterday, and it was going to Cancun yes. or coming back. No, exactly. Oh wow! I was about to say a friend of mine flew on, flew to Cancun with Lufthansa two months ago. She was alone in the flight, which is fantastic, wow. uh, or not, depending on which. I mean, for a passenger point of view, I would love to fly in a flight alone once. For the airline, it truly sucks. So that's not. Um... Yeah. So Alex, uh, mo- moving on. Did you get your uh, BA first class dining at home? Uh, no why would i pay for that (laughs) so look because we'll talk about food let's do this (laughs) oh (laughs) when the worlds collide i love it so you restarted you restarted mastication nation way before i actually did this you have a few episodes out so guys if you haven't i'm sure you have if you haven't listened to the rebirth of uh, Will's and Alex podcast do. Uh, it's it's always so cool to listen to you guys. I finally caught up with the episodes. I was last last time I told Alex I only had listened to once. Finally, I caught up. Well, I hope we right. I hope we did Finland justice, and my our pronunciation was suitably amusing. <laughs> Jeez, dead <laughs> language. Yeah, I know. That's why I didn't. That's why at home when I was brought up, I learned Greek and not Finn. I mean, Finn, I know like curse words and some words for food, and that's about it. Uh, because yeah, it's complicated, yeah. <laughs> and 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 also everybody speaks English there. I mean, so it's you. yeah. So um, food, first class dining. What did you think about all these initiatives of having food at home or on the ground with aircraft not flying and just being there? Where was I? I no. <laughs> well, you know, it was interesting because there were, like you said, there were these ones where you could have the BA first class dining, and it would be sent to your house. And I thought, well, no, no it's, it's not. It, no, I'm not going to do that. But then <laughs> Singapore Airlines and a few others would do these. You could go onto a plane on the ground. I think A and A did this as well, and you would have the in-flight experience, but not go anywhere. I'm like, that's just, you know, it's like punching yourself in the face, right? Would you have done it if if it had been possible, let's say, in the UK? Okay, you've flown a little bit, but let's pretend you don't fly for 12 months. BA says you can go through a 380 or Dreamliner and be even in first class for a reasonable price and you get served. Would you have done it? No. <laughs> because for me, the magic is actually the flight, right? The, the, exactly. the, 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 the flight uh, as, a, as a, par- a physics thing, not, not <laughs> getting from food. I, I, when we were launching Virgin America, before we ever um, flew, we did that. We, we all got on a, one of our planes, the whole company, because there were so few of us. And we did a simulated flight to LA and back so that the, the cabin crew um, could practice and work out any kinks okay. and see what worked and what didn't work. Uh, and it was so boring. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't, the, it was, I mean, it was, of course it was interesting for us to try all the, the food that we were going to be serving and, and the IFE, which was so bad and unreliable at the beginning. It was kind of collectively embarrassing, but no, I would absolutely <laughs> not do do anything like that i think the attraction i have for walkthroughs of static aircraft at museums is because they're like a time capsule right you you're you're going through and seeing what it was like in the 60s or the 30s that's different that's totally different than going and would you have done would you have done one of these uh flights to nowhere you know we actually you would actually fly let's say for a couple of hours and return to the same airport uh, they did that. I remember Taiwan. No, Taiwan. I think was on the ground, like you said, with food. Australia for sure did that. Yeah, just did. Um, Taiwan was on the ground. I... S- Singapore airline was on the ground, like you said. ANA, I think, was on the ground as well. I, I forgot. There's a- another airline who did these flights to nowhere. I, I wouldn't have done it. I don't myself. think not, so. I don't think know. so either. Because the destination is the as well. You know, there's a flight. You know, the the, the biggest thing I think. I didn't say that last time. I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't able to put that into words for a long time. I think the biggest thing I missed 
I mean, of course, I miss the flight. I miss the friends in other places. I mean, simply in other places. In Kent, having seen to see Alex, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's super far. It, yeah, everywhere feels <laughs> but, far right now. But but it's the anticipation. Yeah. You know, you're looking for the flight. You, like you and me, like spending way too much time on Google Flights, finding that right route and maybe something a bit bizarre because we want to try a product. And that's, you build the anticipation, even to the point at some point, it's even better in your head that it will end up being, but that's the part of the beauty of it. Like it's, and you can have anticipation to have a drink with a friend. It's the same, by the way, right? But, and since you're you're not basically projecting yourself into the future, into like what could be a holiday or a trip, or you know, like you may be recording an attaché episode with Greg in some weird place, right? So, and and a flight to nowhere doesn't give you that because yes, I'm flying. Yes, I mean. Um, and, and, you know, probably also we're privileged because we've been flying so much that we know most of the products, so maybe it's not really a discovery, but yeah, flying from London to London or Singapore to Singapore, I'm like, yeah, well, no, I'd rather do something else. There's yeah. no real... You no, know, I, 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 don't, I mean, that's the magic, isn't it? I mean, that's the whole point right. in a way is you, you get on a plane, it's cold and dark, and then you watch a movie, read a book, eat some food, and you, and it's, it's, it's balmy, and there's different sights and sounds and smells and people and that that's the magic and allure of 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 travel and you're doing it 37,000 feet at 600 miles an hour you know that for me is the magic, which you would get in a flight to nowhere but i don't know i that i love yeah, but flight, flight to I nowhere you would not it's not the same yeah you would not get i i, I i'm not saying that i i miss getting diverted but there's not that element of surprise not that it happened to me a lot but i'm saying it's almost too well run. I mean, flying from point A to point A makes, at first it makes no sense. Even if, I mean, I get maybe from the airline's point of view, there was some revenue, maybe anyway, you pilots had to train to keep their license yeah. on. So you could, oh yeah, I, you can I go with Sims. So yeah, I don't so. begrudge it at all. I just, it doesn't, it's not attractive. If it was like, you know, the last 747 flight or, or, yeah. or something new or unique or whatever, sign me up. Yeah. But just to do it for the sake of doing it, as much of a flying dork as I am, <laughs> you know, getting crammed into a 320 to, no, I'm, I'm good. Yeah. Uh, um, to finish on food, I think um, Thai was the one that was, I think Thai is bankrupt. Are they really? But, you know, bankruptcy, the, also, oh. you know, it's like chapter 11. So bankruptcy doesn't mean it's liquidation, guys. It could mean that it's bankrupt and it's restarting. So I'm not sure the, the status of Thai currently because for a while they couldn't fly. To, I mean, still, the country's still closed, by the way. So I'm not exactly sure about the current status. But I remember at the very beginning of the pandemic, probably in April last year, they were starting, because the employees were not doing anything, they're starting selling food at the HQ. So you could go and get the same type of airline food, but it was really made like, it was like almost like a shed in front of the HQ and people would go there and, and like take, take away food. So that was kind of fun. And and it became so successful that then Thai Airways food was available in convenience stores across, th <laughs> across Thailand, which is pretty incredible when yeah, you think about it. Yeah, that is, I mean, and I, the, if I was in a convenience store and I saw something like that, I, the, the, again, the airplane dork in me would probably be like, I, well, I need to buy that for science, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, me too. It's different. That's different. Yeah, it's not like going on BA's website and ordering first class dining at home. I mean, at first, I'm not really a big ordering guy. I prefer mm -hmm. to cook. But if I had a choice, yeah, if I go to Tesco and I see some like dorky BA something, I'm like, oh, yeah, I need, of course I need to yeah. try this. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Uh, Swiss, Swiss was cool. Uh, sadly, they forgot about us because they they were not using all those chocolates that they give yeah, out to every passenger. So they, they had this huge amount of chocolates. I think it was more than five hundred thousand little pieces of chocolate, you know, wrapped chocolate that they. I think they were about to expire or something. So I mean, I just said they forgot about us, but the cool thing they they sent all those to hospitals oh, that's and NGOs. Idea. Yeah, I so thought that, you were going to say they loaded cool. them into a triple seven and carpet bombed Zurich with chocolate. <laughs> that would <have> been... <laughs> the world's the world's biggest fondue. Why not? Uh, 
just before I ask you about your flights, is because it's just kind of related. Um, so Speedbird, the beer mm-hmm. that was created by Brewdog, is no more because it was the, the beer for the 100th an anniversary of BA, however, it's been replaced by Jetstream, which is probably the exact same beer, just a different name. Um, uh, have you? And by the way, guys, I had that was so cool because Brewdog. I guess they had too many of the Speedbird 100, and you could order them yeah. on their own website. And I ordered like 60 or something. <laughs> so it was great. It's great for barbecue. You did. You ordered summer. 60. I think that, uh, so 48 plus one more, so wow, yes. Cool. I didn't know that. <laughs> it's yeah. good. It's a and good it, beer. All, this, all the Brewdog stuff beer. is good. It's a, it's a good beer. And, and unlike uh, Betsy, I've, I haven't tried a new Betsy. No, me but neither. Unlike Betsy, unlike Betsy, Betsy, I didn't really like it on the ground. I really enjoyed it in the air. I think Speedbird works great on the ground as well. So, um, yeah, I ordered a few. So now it's Jetstream. So I'm going to ask you, have you seen Jetstream and how are your flights, the latest ones, anything different from the ones you discussed with us last time? <laughs> yeah, so they, they have Jetstream on board at BA. Did you try? Yes, I did. It's uh, I, I couldn't tell you if it was different from, it's unremarkable, which is exactly what you want <laughs> in a beer, right? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, a, yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a lager, <laughs> it's, it's brew dog, so it's good. It's nothing, yeah, nothing nothing remarkable about it. Um, I actually, you know, uh, I took notes. Um, oh, yeah, because I never do that. I was telling Megan uh, that I, y- you always take notes, and I never take notes. And I was like, ah, I, there was so much going on because, um, oh wow, think that much? Yeah, well, things things are different, and also, um, yeah. Well, I'll get to the what was so different about it. But go ahead, go ahead. At least it's your your show. I mean, I, I talked listening. about the the process at Heathrow, which actually hasn't changed that much. Um, you still don't get alcohol in the lounge because it's indoor dining doesn't happen for another five days. Um, mm-hmm. So, and that and that's fine. I think BA have have cracked it, and they've done they've done really well uh, from from that perspective. Okay. There was a lot. Going back to this point, which I made in the last episode about the inconsistency of the of the rules, the application mm-hmm. of the rules, there was a lot of scrutiny at even at first class check in uh, for purpose of travel. Oh, I had never been asked once, and I still wasn't. But um, there were people either side of me who were getting grill grilled, and there were there were phone calls being made. Which I thought was interesting, which makes me think that maybe the airlines were starting to get um, a little either fined or something. Yeah, just, just hold on. I'm sorry to interrupt. I know I keep interrupting you all the time. No. <laughs> because I think you didn't mention that last time. So there was a requirement. I think it's ending on May 17th. Correct. But there was a requirement that you needed to bring a form to justify why you were traveling yes. at, and the airline, it's the airline responsibility to check that form and to make sure that you're allowed to travel for one of their allowed reasons, which are many. Yeah. I mean, there are, yeah, it's a, right. it's a reasonable list and it's a reasonable, yeah, exactly. So where you ever ask, like, because what you just said, you said you, you I wasn't asked where you, did you just drop the form and walk through? No, you don't even, I, you were, I never, I printed it out always. You fill it in online like the passenger locator form and you I, I i i brought it with me and at no point during the window that this rule was in place was i ever asked for the purpose of my travel let alone to produce this document how oh. and and nor did i see anybody else and 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 those that i know have also traveled no one else has been asked for it as well so did you fe- do you feel like this time it was a randomized check so you were just looking no at i think there was more scrutiny and because i saw it happening um i was prepared for it and you know I, my reasons me, my yeah me. i mean my reasons for travel were legitimate and you know i, I the the people at the front line have a difficult job enough as it is, so I wanted, of wanted to be ready, but never came. It's up. almost unfair, by the way, to give that responsibility to airlines. Completely, it should be to border control or you know, like a government body. Yeah, but the so, airlines themselves, it's kind of. And since there's no outbound immigration uh, in the yeah, UK, yeah. there's no point at which they can do that. But 
Yeah, because they not only have to check COVID results and all that, which you, you know, you show them and whatever. And what's interesting is I mentioned it on the last episode, this Verify app. Um, at the gate, they're really pushing it. Like, do you have the Verify app? You know, multiple PAs. Make sure you have it. Get it, have it up, ready to go, otherwise produce your form. But they really are pushing. And I can see why, because they just look for a split second. You've got your... You've got your um, Department of State CDC declaration. You've got your COVID test in there. Everything else is in there. They just have to glance at it. So that that to me was really, really interesting. Um, and, it, and it works well. I mean, my flight had 57 people on it. Uh, it on a, on a, on a Dreamliner. Right? Yeah. yeah it's, um, it's okay. Which is, yeah, I think it's... it's. Uh, before you get there, sorry, again, I'm interrupting you. Do you think... Um, is it, uh, it's not about the reason to travel, but do you think it's easier in general to travel if you have a second passport? Because my thinking was always that even though, let's let's say, so my parents are, are no longer with us, so let's say I wanted to go back to Switzerland, there's little that they can actually tell me not to go back to a country where I yes. have a passport from. I would definitely even if I'm say- a resident here, at some point, I'm like, guys, it's also my home country. I have two, I guess, I have three passports, but you know what I mean? Yeah. So oh, it's just, do you think easier. that it helps that you have an American passport, even if you don't show it, uh, no matter the reasons, and you had good reasons, this is not the point, but do you think it would any way be easier because you have an American passport? Yes. Guys, I'm just going home. Uh, absolutely. I, and I, right, I, I, absolutely. Yeah makes a difference although i've never had to use that as a justification for travel yeah, of course but yeah, okay, just okay. purely from a you know paperwork perspective yeah it definitely helps and that's why yeah. you know the the vast majority of my of my flights have been to the u.s, the US. um so you were saying 57 people in the yeah and flight. sorry people uh are, seem generally prepared because there's a there's so few of us that are that are traveling a lot of Parents with with kids um, that have oh. come over for for whatever reason, um, and uh, yeah, so I th- they you know, people seem prepared with the paperwork and ready to go. Th- they still do the boarding from the back to the front, and that's that's fine. I was in uh, I was in business. Um, BA are getting better about spontaneous upgrades. Um, Nice. Yeah, it never happened to me. I mean, ever. it doesn't. It's only happened to me a couple of times, but it, it. But it is happening. I was trying to because I'd already talked about um, the airport experience in the last episode, which hasn't changed, mm-hmm. other than more, much, many more shops are open and eateries. Oh, nice. Whereas the last time I went, uh, when I did the whole thing with BA and Virgin about the experiences, nothing. Nothing. Maybe so, because maybe because the UK has allowed yes, people to non-essential retail shops, is back right? open yeah, and yeah, and yeah. Uh, so almost every shop in T five was open. Oh, nice. But I was I was challenging myself to be a little bit more observant about the airport, and uh, one thing I noticed was that over at T four, which is currently non-operational, mm-hmm. there are dozens of BA short haul aircraft so 319s and 320s dozens and dozens parked parked oh, yeah. engines covered oh um and i don't know if they were somewhere else and maybe in france where a lot of them have been stored and have just come back recently and are waiting to come back line or if they've been there the whole time but there were I, there must have been 30 40 oh parked wow. basically oh. from the what would it be the west side of the airfield uh on the south side, all the way through to the cargo uh, area. So yeah. all across the T4 ramps, both sides. Uh, so th- that was an, it, quite weird to see. There was an Aero Mexico 787 parked no way. with the title stripped. Oh, wow. Damn. I'm still trying to find out what the deal with that is, whether it was impounded because Aero Mexico are bankrupt. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, or if they've, it seems like a weird place for it to be if it was stored because it must be expensive to keep aircrafts on Heathrow grounds. You'd rather put them in Spain or, yeah, exactly. There were so many 
maybe that's a story for another episode yeah. or maybe we should if guys if any of you is a specialist in airport in aircraft storage and you want to get on the show just hit oh, us up because i would, I we would so love to questions. have a little more understanding of not only how do you make it happen the type of and perhaps also the difficulty of relaunching you know after an aircraft has been idle for x amount of time anyway go no, back. No. but it's expensive for aeromexico to keep an i aircraft don't Ethro. think that they own it right. anymore whether they no. like it or not <laughs> so that was but even if it's a lesser maybe like you said maybe it's a litigation because if i were a lesser I would not leave it again at Ethro. I would put it in, you know, there was like Spain, there's one very famous yeah. um, storage facility and in Spain. And one in France too, where VA sort of uh, uh, yeah, storing their yeah, 380s. Yeah. So that was that was kind of interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, the flight itself was was reasonably, was reasonably uneventful. BA are back to sort of full full service, as, I'm, as I've mentioned in the last episode. Cool. Yeah. Um, so, but again, arriving in San Francisco... Um, I was the first person off the flight in the A wing of the International Terminal, if you know San Francisco well. Not a soul anywhere. Not a single person. Not a member of staff. No one. Just the person in the at the at immigration. And immigration now, like I've said, I don't even hand over my passport. They say, look in the camera, biometrics, welcome back. That's amazing. That's 30 cool. seconds tops and you're out. That's cool. Uh, Which means they've pre-checked all the documents as well, very fly whatever I, before. I, I guess. guess. I don't I, know. I don't because that's know. part of the API now, like advanced passenger information. Perhaps the airline has to input that, yeah, COVID negative test taken in time and all that stuff, right? But that would make sense, at least. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm maybe talking out of my ass, but it would just make sense that to streamline this operation that if you've... If BA has already checked that you have the proper negative test in yeah. the US, it just transmits that information to the US and that should be it. Yeah, right? I, I I would love to know more about, I mean, certainly not complaining, yeah. it's so, so easy <laughs> yeah. and you're out. I mean, there was a Turk, yeah. we've followed a Turkish 777 uh, on final, but they went to the other terminal, to the other part of the international terminal. And even then, like okay. looking at the uh, their arrivals area, friends and family waiting, there weren't that many people, so the flight can't have been that full. But mm -hmm. so that was that was reasonably straightforward. Weirdly, BA don't have a direct flight back from San Francisco on a Monday. What? Oh, uh, oh I see. I don't know why. So I had to book uh, uh, via Dallas. Whatever you know, okay. not the end of the world. Yeah. And no, no. So I booked the flight month not months ago, but like about a month before I traveled. And so, you know, I've got, it's a two hour connection. Dallas is big, but it's domestic to international. So it should be fine. There's, I don't have to rush. And a couple, like literally later that day I booked it, I went online and I looked at the flight because uh, I booked it on American, even though it was going to be BA uh, and then American from, da from San Francisco to Dallas and then BA again, Dallas to, to, to London. You. Yep. It was an American ticket because uh, it just, I can't remember why I did it, but it just ended up being cheaper. And my connection time went from two hours to negative five minutes. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> oh my God. What the hell? Uh, like, so be, Americans sold the, the. Back to the future. They'll only sell a connection that you can make. That they're confident well, they won't ticket it if you won't make the connection. So I thought that's 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 the rule also at Frankfurt. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, they will only make it if you can run a sub eleven second hundred meters, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, what the hell? So I call American Airlines, and they're like, well, obviously you've made a mistake. I'm like, no, you ticketed this. And the lady, like, you could hear her on the keyboard, and she's like, what the oh, hell? Oh my she's God. like, this doesn't make any sense. Uh, she's like, hold on a second. Puts me in hold for 20 minutes. And then she's coming back every five minutes to like, say, I'm so sorry. Yeah. She's like, I've got my supervisor and my supervisor. And it turns out that as I booked the flight, BA loaded a huge schedule change oh at the same God. time. No way. So they had moved their Dallas London <laughs> flight from like 9.55 to 8 p.m. Oh. at the same time. And it, because the airline world lives in the Unix yeah. green screen days, it took like <laughs> twelve hours to refresh. So refresh, yeah. uh, I, 
she sounds funny. She's like, I'm going to, I'll move your Dallas, San Francisco, Dallas earlier. Um, sorry, but it means it'll give you an, it, you'll have an hour layover. She's like, we, it's, I'm, it's letting me ticket it, which makes me, you know, so we think that you could make that connection. It's domestic to international. You should be fine. I was like, okay, whatever. No problem. So I take my, um, oh, so that should remember that just for a second. COVID tests. So I've been like, I've been testing all of the test kits, you know, just trying to find out which is better and the most efficient and the most, you know, I guess efficacious, if you will. Yeah. I've on this trip, I used cured, Q U R E D dot com. I've heard about that name. Yeah. Yeah. Really clever way of doing it. So they, you tell them what type, the purpose of the test. So I, I ordered two. One was, to go into the US or leave the UK and one was to come back into the UK. So they send you basically identical antigen kits. Okay. Then you book an appointment uh, within 72 hours of your, tr- of your flight for a FaceTime uh, consultation. And they walk you through it and watch you do the test. Uh, the, the, swab. the swabbing of your nose and throat and then putting the liquid onto the test cassette and you know, all of that. that and to make sure that you actually are, are doing, doing it, it properly. That takes about yeah. three minutes. And then you wait, you set a timer for 20 minutes. You get the result on the cassette. You take a picture of it next to your passport. Oh, you, wow. Within 20, uh, after 20 minutes, but before 30 minutes, otherwise it's invalid. Send them the picture. And then within about 20 minutes, you get your certificate to fly. And then I did this. So I brought the second kit with me to, ca- to California did it within the time frame, did the consultation, and I had both pieces was that, of paper. But it's UK based? It, uh, As in, did you have to take care of the time zone when you were doing it? Yes, I had to, to, have I had to take th- to consider, yes, so they are about. UK. Okay. Yeah, but it's a cool. And it was 39 yeah, pounds cool. of test. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah, which is, and it's 59 at Heathrow, um, which is, and that's also a good service, but yeah, it's actually yeah. It, so that that worked. The price is okay. Actually, I mean, the prices you're quoting me, I was about to talk about that a bit later, are okay. Yeah. So they were fine compared to the usual two of not the usual, but some people quote 150 yeah. to 100. I mean, this so is it, it, that fair. was fine. So you, um, I couldn't, um, I couldn't check in online because they need to check these things uh, for my San Francisco, Dallas, London flight. So I went to the Harvey Milk, the new terminal at San Francisco, which is oh yeah, wonderful, really, really good. Um, I'll make a note that we will cover. I have a list of airports we need, we've never covered with this one. So we'll, yeah, it was it was, okay, it was okay. good um, for another day. But they yeah. they okay. ticketed me all the way through to 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 London, and uh, the I went to the um, to the lounge in, in in that airport, and it was fine. Um, they're doing these sort of pre-packaged buffet food, which BA doesn't do yet. BA is all order at your at your table service. Just too. Mm-hmm. Whereas American are doing these like pre-packaged cheese, pre-packaged crap, everything like that. So you, you're not, and it was fine. Everybody was super friendly. So my, the flight to, uh, to Dallas, it was a three twenty one. I was in the first row of economy. Um, American are doing, they've, they do um, uh, really blazing fast Wi-Fi, um, streaming through your device. You have IFE. Mine didn't work. It was the touchscreen had died. But it's all stored. There's no live anymore, which is, is fine. You can stream to your device. You, the, I like American long haul. Short haul, it was okay. But now it, you get like a Ziploc bag with a bottle of water, some peanuts and some wipes, and that's it. Like no soda, no nothing. And oh, yeah. so a couple of things during the flight. The, the line between COVID and Costco. Yeah, I'm like, I'm excited to see how long you guys can milk this one for. Yeah. And it's going to take somebody pushing the boat out and, 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 and bringing back normal service before everybody else does. Um like I said, the Wi-Fi, and I love having Plane Finder open uh, while I'm flying because I can just look around and see what's open. Immediately, what I noticed is the amount of military traffic on the West Coast. Ooh. Like, I was watching 60-year-old Strato tankers, dozens of T-38s, Talons, the military jet trainer, 
uh, a DC-3 that was running up and down, like just tons of military traffic, which is, which is kind, of, kind of fun to watch. I was also watching my BA flight come in from London to Dallas. Oh yeah, to make sure to monitor where yeah, it is, like, to make sure you're not how you know it, right? my flight's on time. We're going to get that. We left on time. It looks like we're going to actually be early because uh, we pushed back on time. And I was like, the my BA flight left London an hour late. I'm going to have uh, look looking like it at least two hours. I can get something to eat at Dallas. Great, no problem. So we're coming into Dallas, and uh, the, as we're sort of maybe in 45 minutes out, the captain comes on and says, so there's a line of weather between us and Dallas, uh, and I look on, on on the weather thing, and yeah, there's this big red stripe between us and Dallas, like from Oklahoma City down to almost as far as Austin. And he's like, we're going to have to circle for a little bit and let it pass too, but it's moving quickly. It shouldn't be more than about 20, 25 minutes. 25 minutes goes by. 45 minutes goes by. I'm looking on on Plane Finder and Plane Finder will has this when you look when you click on a flight and it says like SFO DFW with an arrow. Mm-hmm. If a pl- if a flight has been diverted, it becomes a cross, like two diverging yeah. arrows. Converging arrows, I should say. And there was one and then another, oh, and then another. Oh, no. and, then, and it comes on after about an hour, and I'm watching the BA flight coming from the north, like <laughs> over the, over Chicago, over the Great Lakes. And it says, uh, two tornadoes have touched down just north of Dallas, and the whole airport is shut. We're going to Austin. <laughs> oh, <laughs> And I was like, here's me being all cocky and confident, thinking I've got this, you know, I'm going to have uh, some barbecue in Dallas airport or whatever, going, Shh, I'm not going to make this. So we... We joined the queue to go down to Austin, and uh, I'm watching the BA flight. So we we come in, we land in Austin, and I'm looking at flights, and I'm supposed to be kick, picking my kids up, you know, later that day. So I'm like, what am I going to do if I don't make this? And then we land at Austin, and we park over uh, on this ramp, and you could people were just coming in, parking next to us. There's military traffic parked all next to us. We're all lined up. We refuel. We're sitting on the ground. And I'm watching the BA flight. And then all of a sudden, the BA flight starts circling. Ah, and I was like, go on, go news. on, bugger off. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Go away. Go away. <laughs> go, go, go to Oklahoma City or something like that. Just don't go to Dallas. And I'm also kind of looking at what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Interestingly, the ground crew from came over from the terminal at Austin and said, if you want to get off here, you can. Anybody who wants to get off. Because if you live halfway between Dallas and Austin, maybe I think maybe only two people did. As we're refueling, I see, and the BA flight is dropping altitude and dropping altitude and dropping altitude. And I was like, oh, no. And then eventually, they carve through the storm and are one of the first planes to to attempt to land. We're taxiing out to try and come you know, back to Dallas, and I'm listening to the tower at Dallas, and you hear like I'm, I'm listening, and the BA flight is cleared to land, and I'm watching it on flight radar, and it's like, you know, like two thousand feet, seventeen hundred, sixteen hundred, fourteen hundred, two thousand, two thousand five hundred, three thousand, <laughs> and all you hear is Dallas Tower speedbird mist. They had a 25 knot tailwind on the approach, and they're like, "Yeah, we're we're giving." And the pilot sounded stressed. I mean, the pilot sounded really, really stressed out. Um, there was, as we're coming into Dallas, there's thunderstorms all around us, just relentless lightning. We're we're getting just absolutely thrown around like anything. And eventually, the BA flight lands, and I'm like, you know what? If they've got a Z plane and clean and Recater and get the cargo on cargo. I might make this. And I told the flight, uh, the the cabin crew, I was like, "Listen, if you can get me out," and they're like, "Yeah, no problem. We got a lot of people in your situation." So we were waiting and we're waiting. We we eventually land, and the 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 flight crew do a great job. And as we're taxiing onto our stand, I see the BA flight taxi pass me to go and take off. No. 
Oh my god! So, but interestingly, for, for for the longest time, your story, I'm like, he's gonna be at the next gate or something. To, I was like, oh. No. No. So he, that was the first diversion I'd ever had <sighs> in my life. Really? Yeah, and oh, if wow. I didn't have to be there to pick up my kids the next morning, I would have rather enjoyed it. But I wasn't able to really kind of fully appreciate it, and I got a. I, I didn't know what to do. It was eleven o'clock at night, and and Dallas Airport was shutting down because it's not that much going on at that time. At least the terminal I was in, and they announced uh, uh, on the plane. Listen, if you go to customer service at gate twenty five. And I did, and they said, okay, we've put you on the American flight tomorrow afternoon at 3 p.m. And I was like, 3 p.m.? It's 11, oh, what do I, on. what do I do? And they're like, um, tough luck? Yeah. Like, it's a, it's weather, so we don't have to get, put you in a hotel. <sighs> so I was like, I don't, I, 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 I don't know anybody in Dallas. Uh, and I was exhausted, so I... I just booked myself a room at, at the airport hotel there, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, there was it was not their responsibility to 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 sort me out. Apparently, I could have got a discounted rate at one of the hotels, but it would have been like, I, you know, by you know, shuttle bus ride to a hotel, and then I would have yeah been, yeah yeah not directly next to the. So I was just like, you know, my my travel insurance like yeah yeah of course we'll cover it. So it was, and then I grabbed the flight back, the American flight back. Which was a uh, a triple seven. We absolutely hauled butt back across the Atlantic because of the winds, and had to to wait, circle almost over my house for about an hour because we were so early. Um, American international, even in the economy, is, is is still pretty good. But and I'll end on this point. So we got to. T5, I was, I, I walked uh, on the walkway because I still don't really like being around, I know, uh, that many people on the, on the um, automatic train. And the, the way that they have it is everybody can, st- everybody that was allowed to use the E-gates is still ushered over to one side. So all European Union passport holders, Australians, Americans, New Zealand's, and obviously Brits. We had a flight and this this is delicate, but I'm just going to tell tell it how it happened. We had a flight from Accra land ahead of us, and a flight from Lagos land, both BA land ahead of us. Um, the queue must have had I don't know a hundred people ahead of me. It took me 45 minutes to go through, but the way it worked was you would snake back and forth, moving towards the the, the immigration desks. If you can picture T5 mm-hmm. immigration, mm-hmm. and then you would snake back alongside of that queue to go and talk to one of three immigration officers who would check your negative COVID test, your passenger locator form, and the confirmation email for your day two and day eight tests. So hold on, you have two different interactions. Well, no, because once, the... you, once you talk to those, oh, you don't actually talk you actually... to those the, that first. Oh, you actually go through the e-gate for your passport verification, but then you still have to go through a man. All the way around. To... Oh, so sorry. they these three immigration officers check your three forms, and then you then go you through the e gate yeah. to to say you can come into the country. Which 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 indicates, I mean, there's been talk in the UK, and that's going to happen. We indicate they need to get fast on having everything digital for yes. that. because it's this it's the op- is that what, the opposite of what you've just encountered in the US. You have to go through like man booth and everything. Whereas a lot of this, especially. And it's not here to discriminate, but especially for, like you said, the the, the nationalities who are anyway fast track. Yes, coming for a specific countries is not too hard to do, and actually they're planning it to, to be. No, fair, I mean, right? it's uh, you know the the queue that I was in, you know there was almost everybody um, was either on my flight or the Accra or the Ghana flights because those were the only flights that are arrived. We were all in the right queue and we all had the right yeah. paperwork, but at a, at a procedural level. Uh, it was what it was, and but there is something far more sinister that I uh, I witnessed, um, which is a cultural problem at uh, the Home Office and border uh, border force. So we had there were three officers, and yeah. uh, w- there was 
you can edit this out if you want to, but I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm going to be real about what I observed. No, please be. There was one, uh, Caucasian officer and two non-white officers. The non-white officers were like, uh, let me see your, your passenger locator form. Let me see your COVID test. Let me see the email results. Okay. Nice one on your way through mm -hmm. the white one would do the same thing. But if you were, if you were a non-white yeah. passenger, why were you traveling? How long were you in, uh, uh, in Ghana or, or Nigeria for? Who? And these were British citizens. They did not have yeah. to answer those questions. And I was like, I, no, I can't wait for you to ask me those questions, man. <laughs> ask exactly. Me I dare you because I know the law. I know how it works. Yeah, you no, don't get to ask not, those questions, yeah, you know? No. That's Why were you traveling during a pandemic as well? You know, no, it's just, who did that? You know, ask me that when I'm leaving, not when I'm coming into the country. It's got nothing to do with no, COVID. Exactly. It's got nothing to do with the E. Yeah, the law is clear. If you're a British citizen, you're allowed to come back to Absolutely. the UK, no matter where you were. You could have been over for a year. You're a resident and or your uh, passport holder. You have the right. That's it. That's, that's just that, that. Yeah. There's no question. Yeah. There, and right? it's, and so this is an acceptable. Yeah. Behavior. And it is. And, and when Megan came to see me, she had a, a, a similar experience. Um, or I didn't ask or ascertain what the nationality or the, the, the ethnicity or whatever you want to use of the, but why are you here? You know, we don't, you know, this isn't for holiday making the, the British border is not closed to, to Americans. They are allowed to come. They're allowed to, you know, to, to, to come to the country. Uh, well, it's not, it's not Europe. So it's right. I, I find that a disturbing threat. No, but that's, that they were never, they were, I mean, you know, there's, I mean, you could look at what happened a hundred years ago with um, the other pandemic and you could read, I think I, th I sent you like a year ago, this article where uh, you could see the, the French were, and you know, to point my finger at the French guys, <laughs> but the French were closing everything uh, travel-wise. Of course, a very different era. Of course, we didn't have Dreamliners and travel around the world, but they were closing everything. And the Brits were not because they wanted to safeguard the routes with um, East India, etc. So basically, the the, the 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 major trading routes. So, and there's it's something that's replicated. The UK never fully closed their borders. It's not. It, you can discuss if it's good or not, but that's almost in the DNA of world travel leaving in the uk being open for trade again we can disagree but that's, that's what happened yeah. so to make the point it was never closed there were discouragement there was this paper form there was a lot of stuff that made like we said in the last episode a signal a deterrent for people to not travel but at the same time and it's been reported many times at the same time the home office kept delivering even for those who are who aren't british they kept delivering visas to come to the uk during the pandemic so again it's their own policy is was to okay people to come in again we can discuss if it was good or bad it's not the point of this podcast but you, they cannot at the same time say it's fine and then act like this at the border you cannot no. do both choose either be singapore and say the country's closed 21 days in a hotel and by the way because that's something i've also i know now because of friends working in singapore they tell you if you're a resident, I'm not talking if you're a Singapore passport holder, but if you're a resident, long-term resident in Singapore. So if you're Alex or Paul living in Singapore, you want to go, let's say for you to the UK, to the US, or for me to, I don't know, Greece or wherever, they'll tell you, you're not coming back. Yeah. I mean, we can say it's disgusting or not. Again, that's, but at least they're consistent in how they apply the law. Whereas you cannot, and I know I repeat myself, you cannot say it's okay to come in and then have to go under this type of duress at no. the border. It's just it, it is, and it's you know, it's ask, acceptable. If you really you know, why are you traveling during a pandemic? I mean, that's not the question you ask when you're coming back to the. Let me say, oh, oh, sorry, I'll go back. You know, what's this? It's just it was just. And again, there's a lot of reasons why it's allowed. A lot of people I know that people felt sometimes envious of other people, especially through social media. So I caught social media. So, but you know, there's so many reasons. I, I know so many friends of mine. We're, we can talk about families, of course. This, but there are work reasons. I'm, I'm talking about people that work in vaccines delivery. Yeah. That's that's the most obvious. But of course, when you don't know they work at vaccine delivery, you're like, what, what is that guy doing here? Well, you need this guy because he helps the country doing the campaign. So I think 
But that's but that's different because that's us, you know, people online, whatever, I don't care. But an official stance or like an official representative of the law and of the country at the border shouldn't be. No, it's not that it's not that and, and by the way, I mean <sighs> Yes, they, 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 they should and they will digitize a lot of these processes to come because anyway, we'll be living with testing for a while. We'll be living with a lot of more uh, paperwork, let's put it that way, for a while. Uh, but their job in the past, even the past, let's say, few months that it's kind of picked up a little bit because it's still crashing. I mean, Mithro has 91% less passengers than before, for instance. But I feel myself that they didn't make an effort they were always, you've been there, I haven't, but they were, it seemed that they were always like five, six officers with honestly, when you have a queue that is two hours, you put 10 because it's a different timing. The, the airport is not even any thrust fault. The airport is not laid out and no airports in the world actually are laid out. Maybe, maybe Tel Aviv, right? Because of security, no airport is laid out to have to do all those health checks. So you just man them more. And come on, it was, I don't know if it was maybe um, something that the government decided to do, like to deter even more travel, like, hey, see, if you come back, you'll have to queue for, but yeah, it's not, it's it's not yeah. okay. Anyway, I, yeah, but I fully, I'm not going to edit this out because I think it's unacceptable. This shouldn't be happening. Yeah, I was, and that's only, I was appalled and embarrassed. I mean, these yeah. were, these were by and large British citizens. Um, no, and it was not, this sort of, luck of the draw type type thing i yeah it was it was uh it was embarrassing and shameful anyway yeah but well i hope uh we don't see that more but yeah you should be flagged that you're right so let's go to lighter content yeah. for the remaining minutes uh what we're an hour and 20 so we can do a little bit more yeah, uh, so you were telling at the top of the show, and that's also, uh, of course, it concerns us. But the, <laughs> the UK, the UK just announced the countries were allowed oh goodness, to yes. to travel in. So I, the, 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 look, we all knew, at least you and me, because we're not too dumb, that they would not suddenly open to everything. No. But of course, as soon as you know, we kind of knew that May seventeenth would be the date where the travel ban super strict, including this form you're supposed to take with you at the airport, was removed. This obligation was removed. But between that and the dream of like ah, oh, every single country in the world will be on a green list was completely and and it was not helped by some brackets i'm doing air quotes here experts online mm. on twitter we said mm, you know what the the fact that the uk is going to announce it's 5 p.m the countries means that it's noon in washington dc so the us will open i'm like where are you yeah, getting this from it's all bs and by the way it was bs because all the countries they authorized basically most of them are closed. close to us i know it was, it was such a tease wasn't it yeah i mean they were so the allowed us to go to New Zealand, you can't go. Australia, you can't go. Singapore, as I said, you can't really go. And it's 21 days of quarantine and you cannot leave the country. <laughs> Israel, you can't go yet. Uh, even Portugal, you can't go. You will be able to go uh, next, next week, week, I think. Or, uh, yeah, so because no, I mean, even Portugal for the moment. Because that's sometimes a bit the entitlement that I see in the press or, of course, the social media, but I vote social media or Av Geeks is like, I have the right to, f to go on holidays. First, that's debatable, but the other country has the right to let you exactly. Eat it does, it's not the UK deciding where you open; it's the other countries that say no. Well, you cannot come. <laughs> you don't have any right or entitlement to go, to, to, go no. to anywhere. By the way, right? It's uh, and it's it's it, uh, sometimes it feels like yeah, but like almost I don't know how to say that. Yeah, I'm going to help them with my tourist money. I'm like, yeah. yeah so you can 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 you be even more condescending yeah. than this, right? <laughs> like they're a charity case, anyway. But anyway, so we'll be. But like we said in a previous episode, we'll be able to travel more. Coming, you know, this will be reviewed every two, three weeks. I yeah, think. three weeks. Yeah, and and every country I've seen Europe is doing the same. Uh, they also starting to because you know some people, for instance, I know this is very UK centric content guy, but guys, but we. 
Um, Qatar is on a red list and UAE is on a red list and they just added, by the way, <laughs> uh, Turkey. So basically the big hubs, you know, Turkish, uh, mm. Qatar Airways and Emirates are on a red list, which means every time you fly one of those, even if it's a layover, you come back to the UK, you're put in a hotel. It's just, again, it's a deterrent to discourage travel from to try to do like multiple layovers to try to trick to get into the country. Fair and fair, debatable, but uh, but. but People don't realize that other countries are doing the same. France is also forbidden Qatar, for instance. It's not like we're so different. Yeah. Every country is trying to open slowly. The, the US, as I said at the top of the show, 130 countries on a do not fly for the moment. Uh, whilst actually, if you look at the numbers, they could start. So it will come slowly over the next few months, at least because I want to be very cognizant. I think I didn't, I wasn't in the last episode. Um, we're lucky because we have vaccines, of course, each of us got the vaccine, but if our countries have, it's dire, dire, dire in many. Mm -hmm. It will take time. And uh, so I want you, because I know from the countries list that I mentioned at the top of the show where you listen from, we totally recognize it's a totally different situation in some other countries yeah. than here in, in terms of the campaign, in terms of the pandemic itself, in terms of how far fast you will or will not reopen. So we're not, not that you think that we're thinking that, oh, this is over, it's fine, because it's really not over, it's not fine, especially for a lot of countries that we love. We love going to some countries that are still in very bad situations now. So we we have blind spots in this podcast. We know we don't talk a lot about Africa because we don't know it that well. We don't talk a lot about Latin America because we don't know it that well. But it doesn't mean we're not cognizant of the situation that, that happened. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there. Um, I think... Uh, <laughs> Two other countries where it's allowed to go to the from the uk i had never heard of them south georgia and the sandwich highlands so i, I believe ryanair is trying to find a way to fly there <laughs> because <Georgia. it's, laughs> from Falkland. yeah it it was that yeah. yeah i i i understand i mean it was a it was a pretty hilarious list and i think that people were surprised a little bit surprised by the u.s given that biden's coming here next month and we, we may we I think it would be like a generic announcement, like maybe like, you know, a bilateral. Yeah, I, th I thing, think so too. Maybe. But also the Ireland and Malta, I think people were very surprised because they seem to meet the same criteria as other countries that were on the list, but were, were excluded. Yeah. But, you know, like you said, every three weeks, they're going to revisit this list. And I think we'll see more and more. And what I'll be interested to see is the first countries that come off the red list. And, yeah. and when that's yeah. going to happen, yeah. what 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 yeah. criteria? Because it's clearly not based on. Currently, there's almost forty or even more. I think it's, it's quite growing. A lot, yeah, it's not, it's not. It's not. It's not. And no one's yeah. come off of it yet. And it's certainly yep. not based from on vaccination rate. It's based on it's a, not that daily case rate, transmission rate, because what the UAE is seeing is high high rate of vaccination, but still high rate of of infection and I, I believe the UAE is mostly because it's a hub. I think they're being punished because yeah. it's a hub. Uh, it's it's again, it's debatable whether it's. A but good also, or not. I mean, and not uh, clearly. I think but, that uh, the vast majority of the vaccinations were uh, a less efficacious version of, of of a vaccine. It's possible. There's there's you know. Uh, like Chile, you remember Chile had a very high rate of vaccination first dose, went into lockdown anyway. But let's not forget that even Israel, if you think three months ago, they had a very high rate and they are they were in lockdown as well. So it's not immediate. You need a little bit of delay between when you get the shot, when it gets actually some immunization. And we know that a single shot, and that's a big thing. Some vaccines, we, we have numbers in the UK yep. now because we have some history whether it's the the two main ones are giving here pfizer and astrazeneca i want to avoid talking names because we're not scientists but basically they're showing that the vaccines in the uk first dose you're pretty sure you have already 80 percent uh, of immunization which is much higher than they thought when they were doing yes. trials some others and there's been trials uh, in other places in the world are less in the first shot and kick up when you get your second one so it's all we're, we're in a transition phase. I don't want to go too much into like science because I've read too much about it, but I'm, I don't feel that I have credibility to talk about vaccines. <laughs> but at least it feels that it's, it's there's still a time, the tape delay 
between the vaccination campaign, the efficacy on the ground, and it will happen. I, I, I have no doubt there might be slight differences, but there's been slight differences all the past 12 months, like stuff that we didn't, it's so hard, you know, like a lot of people, for instance, said, yeah, Japan is fine because they wear masks. Yeah, well, it's more complicated than that. There was a lot of luck in the first phase of where the virus yeah. hit. Uh, so I think it's going to be fine, but I want to recognize that there will, I think we'll still have some hurdles come coming uh, in the in the in the f next few yeah, months. Yeah, I so, do too. Yeah, maybe red list will stay. Uh, amber, by the way, orange in the EU they call it orange in the UK. We call it amber. <laughs> uh, it's discouraged, which actually has importance because for someone like me, for instance, uh, okay, for holidays means what about travel insurance if it's officially discouraged and the same for the US, for instance, if, if it's on a travel ban, what happens? Can you find a travel insurance that would cover you if you were to go against like for leisure? But even for me as a as a as the owner of my own company, my liability insurance could be a problem yeah. if I were to have an issue in a foreign country, uh, even if it's for an allowed reason, it's, it becomes a kind of gray zone about what to do so which explains why so many corporates are not traveling yet because it's complicated not only for the liability of you as an employer telling your employee hey travel oh you're going to catch a virus who is actually liable me because i told you to travel you know it's complicated so they're all holding off which is bad for the airlines because they need uh, corporate yep. travel but also simply because all these health insurances are not clear yet of what should happen Right, <laughs> I, I'm not sure if I if I get sick if I go to Japan tomorrow. It's closed, guys. If I get to Japan tomorrow, I don't. Maybe what you're thinking if you go to record attaché and you catch the virus in any country, even Singapore. I mean, let's not go into a country that is uh, an emerging country, like a country when you trust perhaps the the healthcare system. You're test positive, so no matter if you have nothing because you've been vaccinated, so maybe you just have you know slight symptoms or almost nothing, you're not allowed to fly because you have a positive yeah. test. So what happens in terms of who pays? Do you have to pay your own pocket for two weeks extra at the hotel? Or not, let's not even talk about quarantine hotel if a state forces you to go to, to one, but simply to stay at your hotel. Is your travel insurance, will they say, yeah, well, it's not your fault, so we'll cover it? I, I don't know, man. That, exactly what we exact, have. Yeah, where there's so many use cases that are only going to be discovered when some an, you know anomalous person arrives in a specific destination with a unique set of circumstances. Uh, and then the whole thing, uh, you know, and the reaction, and understandably from governments in that situation will be like, shut it all down. <laughs> shut it all down until we figure this out. In it. But that's that's Singapore, because yeah. when you, I'm sorry to interrupt again, but it's true that when you look at the caseload, when they decided to go to 21 days and shut offices back down and gyms back down like a few days ago, compared to what we have here, like, um, really? But then they never had like huge flare ups. So it's, it's very contextual. It's very hard. This is why it's really hard to compare and really hard to understand what other people are feeling. Because first of all, we all have maybe different feelings about how we perceive the, the the illness and the potential risk, but also because, and that comes to the point we were talk, talking about last week, countries in Asia maybe never had to face the virus because they closed the borders super strictly. What now? If you don't vaccinate, are people, maybe guys, if you live in countries that are we're talking about now, are you anxious about getting a virus? Because here, we can say maybe 20% of, no, maybe not, I don't know, 10% of the population got the virus. And so maybe we're kind of more attuned to the possibility of it that if you live uh, in yeah, a closed box, we never had. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Like, I, I just I just think that still, like Australia, there was one minister that said the other week, like last week, oh, we're going to stay closed until end 2022. I'm like, what? Really? You want to stay closed until end 2022? Yeah, I'm the first one to, to, to agree with a cautious approach. I really agree with the current cautious approach of the UK. I know a lot of people in the travel industry will hate me for that, but no, I, I think know. every time we thought it was it was fine, it wasn't. And every single expert, the same expert that always said it was fine, it got wrong every time. They all, they all want to everything to open now. So I'm like, shut up. You were wrong 20 times, just mm -hmm. shut up. But at the same time, closing the world for the next 10 years doesn't work no. either. 
No. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it's, you know, Australia has been, uh, has always been very uh, protective of its borders from a sort of pathogenic yeah. perspective, you know? Uh, so this is kind of in line with their, with their strategy, but this one is a little bit different. So it'll, I'm very curious to see how they um, get to a place where they're comfortable to reopen the borders. Yeah, uh, at least, yeah, that's because this is not fun. So we'll talk in the next episode a bit more about these things. But uh, I hope that vaccination rates are going up. I mean, there's the problem, the major problem right now is not enough doses. We're seeing that with India. There's great news. If you look, sorry, great news, India doesn't seem to be going the same sentence right now. But if you look at uh, Delhi, where people have been vaccinated. They already vaccinated 135 million people, by the way. It's just that they have 1. 10%. what, yeah. 5, 6 million, <laughs> billion. Where people are vaccinated, it's flattening. So it's, it, wor it's working. It's just that they cannot get enough freaking doses to make it work. So I'm, I'm really, I don't know what to do, open patents, something, because we need like way more people to have access simply to the vaccine. Right now we're talking here from, a, you know, oh, we, we're in the UK, we have our mm -hmm. vaccine, so it's fine. So yeah. And last one on this, um, and I know you agree with me, I find it obscene that, and I'm going to say the name, Pfizer did a deal with the Olympics committee to give vaccines to athletes where, as we just said, a lot of people that are elderly or at risk don't get the vaccine around the world. And even in Japan, people are like, what, 2%, but yeah, let's vaccinate all the athletes. I'm like, yeah. really? No, I agree with you, it is <laughs> Uh, anyway, anyway, uh, let's not talk about the vaccine passports. And in this episode, we'll do in yeah, the next we may one. Be closer, uh, so. I want to do something a little bit more fun now. So what could I could I talk about that is fun? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, maybe, you know what? I'll do um, one of my trips, Singapore. Yeah. Uh, so, so to finish, we have like 15 minutes. So um, I... Last time, there's so many flights we haven't covered that we've both done. Uh, I had a list running, guys, when I was writing down airports that either Alex or me had hit when we were discussing, but we hadn't named an episode after them. So I know there's a lot of like stuff we might not remember, perhaps the flights themselves, but over time, we'll just catch up on the airports, knowing that the airports have perhaps completely changed yeah. now because, of course, with the new time, but it doesn't really matter. So this time, I last time I remember, guys, last time, a year and a half ago, I <laughs> that's a flight from, I think, November 2019. Wow. I had just been from London to Lisbon with a TAP, then six hours for a meeting in Lisbon, then Lisbon to JFK with TAP as well with a 3.30 NEO. I land, I have only 22 hours at GFK uh, for an AGM, super cool, high tower and financial district, great pictures. And I've never posted as usual. Alex knows me, I have many pictures of him that I never posted that will one day. So really cool. Only 22 hours, just a time to get the evening. I landed uh, a beer and some burger and then the, 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 the board meeting and then back to <laughs> essentials. Back to the airport. I tried, by the way, I tried, I had tried for the first time the company called Black Lane, mm. which is kind of an Uber, but the difference is that unlike Uber, I could uh, decide at what time he had to wait for me. I, I, basically, I had to be at the airport around 6, 7 p.m. at JFK from the financial district. Mm. And I was honestly, because I, I know New York, but I don't know New York as someone who commutes, I was like, Shh. I'm going to be in traffic. I'm going to be late. So I'm go I was so anxious that let's say I go down from the the board meeting, I order an Uber, and by that time I need to wait a half an hour until the Uber yeah. comes. I know maybe it's completely stupid, but I was anxious, so I said, "Black Lane, you can say I want a car that waits for me at 4 p.m." And it was waiting for me at 4 p.m. was great. It's like limousine service, a bit expensive. Come on, but peace at least I had a peace of mind that as soon as I stepped out the the entry door of that magnificent skyscraper, I had a car in front of me, and I was just <laughs> straight away to the airport. It was okay. The traffic I arrive at GFK, so I was flying to Singapore. I wanted to go to Singapore via the longest flight ever, which is from it was from I don't know if it's still the case from Newark, Newark yeah. to Singapore. But that's morning flights, and of course, as I said, my meetings were finishing at four. No other choice. I had to be in Singapore at nine a.m. the next morning, which. When you talk about these kind of time zones, next morning doesn't mean jack shit. Mm. <laughs> I had to be. So uh, I had to go with Singapore through Frankfurt. So it's a, it's a very long flight. <laughs> long JFK, way around. Frankfurt, Frankfurt, Singapore. 
But first, I arrive at the the airport, and they didn't have their own lounge, but they gave me access to something that you've known and I had never been to. I had access to the Virgin Club. Oh house. yes. Uh, JFK and what a cool cool lounge again guys this is 2019 content perhaps it's closed now perhaps it's changed but holy cow you know I've never flown Virgin in my life as you know which is a, sh a shame besides Virgin America once in the US it's a shame because it's a brand that is very close to your heart Alex but yeah that's really a cool lounge I could feel the yeah, there was some energy in the, not only the choice of colors, but the way they were in charge. You know, there's one thing I always have myself when I enter a US lounge. I'm like, when I get to the bar, I'm always asking myself, do I need to pay yeah. or not? Which never happens anywhere else. Yeah. Either. I always, yeah, right? It's so true. It, it's so you sort of, <laughs> you, you don't want to actually get anything, but you really want something. You know, I, I completely yeah, exactly. understand. Completely understand. And there, uh, by the way, I was flying first class. Yeah. Yeah, that's important to Singapore flight. I don't know if that Virgin Club house was given to me because it was a first class uh, uh, passenger. I didn't see a lot of seemingly a lot of people going to Singapore. So perhaps was it also to business? But probably maybe only if I don't know. But anyway, it was super cool. There was a pool table in the center of a service at the table. I didn't have to actually pay anything. I just asked. I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so really, my glass was never empty. And that was. And I didn't plan. And that was the strange thing with that flight. A lot of people were clearly going to Frankfurt, not sure. to Singapore. So that flight was made as a night service because it's like it leaves at 9 p.m., I think. Uh, so obviously, it's people were eating in the lounge probably, or I would have eaten the lounge probably to go to sleep quite quickly, right? Which I didn't care because I wanted to sleep before 9 a.m. So I was to be, I was supposed to be at 9 a.m. Singapore time on stage, 6 a.m. Singapore time landing in Singapore. So I said, I want to f sleep in the second bit. So yeah. I'm, oh, so you were I'm kind of bit rested, even if my body didn't want to, but I, so I, for but that would be the only caveat in that flight is that it felt that everything, I mean, it's Singapore first class, man. It's not, uh, it's a three. Okay, I was just about it, to ask I'm, you, I'm on, 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 on 1A, which is lower deck, very front. It's super private because no one goes there, basically. Even the crew is not really set. They sat in the galley, which is behind me. But at 1A, you have basically the staircase next to you. You don't even have anyone looking at you. I, I don't remember, but I don't think the cabin was full. So it's very, very, very private. But it's true that it felt sometimes, and that's the only negative, it felt sometimes that I had to request someone to come first because there's no foot traffic. But compared, if I think about Cathay, I'll talk about that flight another time on First Class or Emirates, where there's always come, someone kind of, you know, peeking, does he have everything he needs? This didn't happen, but that's mm. fine. I had to kind of call. So the, the, the room itself is a room. Uh, it's the old, I want to be very clear, it's the old Singapore Airlines first class. Again, Singapore Airlines, I think, is ditching its 380s. So we will never get a chance to try the new one. At least I got a chance to try the, the old one. It, feel, it felt a bit its age. So there's like two sliding doors, a bit like you would find on an Emirates or um, Etihad, etc. But, but they're, no, no, first, they're not automatic, it's fine. Uh, but you could feel that the wood was a bit old, and that instead of having a either a pane of glass, a pane of glass would make no sense, of course, in an aircraft, it's too dangerous. But there was like some kind of you know Japanese paper, I guess, like you know, kind so of see throughish. You, you do, yeah. But it felt very flimsy. Like every time I was touching the door, like I'm gonna destroy this. I know me. I'm not. I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm not gonna destroy the door of Singapore. So I was like very careful about opening the door or not. You know, like ex you know when you yawn, expanding my fist into the thing, <laughs> like having my fist only appear in the ale. <laughs> but yeah, it's 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 it was it was fantastic. It was fun because when we were on the ground, and I didn't know that you probably know it. Uh, she apologized. She was a she at that time. She apologized. She couldn't uh, offer me champagne because U.S. Yeah. regulation forbade her from doing so. 
and told me you'd have Krug as soon as we take off, which was fine. I was not particularly, but it's interesting that she would tell me that like, even before I request anything, I cannot offer you champagne because US regulations are like, oh, what? Um, so yeah, it's very, I, I'm going to do the bulk of the seat in the second flight. So nice flight, the food, the menu was a bit restricted. Again, I'm not here saying it's a negative because it's a night flight and most people yeah. would have slept. I wanted to eat and I had beef and it was fantastic. I, I'm not going to complain at all about it. The The IFE was the same IFE you get on a business class old 380s. There's a touch screen, I think, but anyway, the seat is so far from the screen that you're never going to be yeah. able to touch it anyway. You're like, eh. So you have like an old remote and it was fine. But it's really the same screen size with a lot of fluff around it. But again, it's not a negative. I'm just saying it's interesting because when you, I've been flying few, quite a few times uh, the business class in, in Singapore Airlines and I could clearly recognize mm. the exact same screen layout, et cetera. So we're not really. Really nice, complimentary Wi-Fi and everything. So very quiet flight. I, I said I didn't want to sleep. I ended up nodding off, you know, because, of course, I had just a full day in New York. At some point, I, was, yeah. I would be nodding off, and I did nod off a little bit, but that was fine. So we land in, uh, we land in, in Frankfurt, and you know how much I love Frankfurt. For once, the only one time in my life, it was fantastic because... In that direction, I heard that in the other direction is not the case. But in that direction, you land, so they, they, they clean the aircraft, they do a um, change of crew, so you, you take your you know hand luggage with you. You land, the, the gate is right in front of the Senator uh, lounge, which is open because it's a satellite, mm -hmm. so there's no first-class lounge, but it's fine. You The gate is right there. You go there, you sit down in the lounge, you wait for a couple of hours, you go back into the plane, you leave. So oh, there was same no, gate, like, same airplane. I need to rush. Yes, same airplane. So basically, it was the easiest Frankfurt experience I ever had because I never had to kind of rush through that tunnel or go through five times through Schengen, non Schengen, or have to deal with security six times that they hate you and they're so slow. So I was like, wow, for once, I actually liked Frankfurt. Apparently, however, uh, if they, I, th I think that flight doesn't happen, of course, because with currently, but if they were to restart restart that flight, what I've heard is if when you go to the other direction, so from F Singapore, Frankfurt, Frankfurt, New York, then you have to go through security. I don't know why. It's a regulation thing, perhaps because you're about to land to the US. Oh, yeah. The US is I'm more sure strict, probably, for security reasons, right? But in that direction, freak fantastic. The lounge, the, the center lounge are always, always great. So, to make the story short, same aircraft, same seat, 1A. Uh, this time, and that's again weird because this time my thinking was at some point I want to sleep, but this is clearly a day flight. So of course, different crew. Uh, and you could see so the, this is a completely different flight. I mean, simply the menu, the menu was 25 pa mm. pages long. Just the lunch itself was four pages by Georges Blanc, which is a famous chef. I was like overwhelmed by the choice even before I was. <laughs> um, I, I said, yeah, it's important that it's, I was, you know, when, what we do, you and me, sometimes we keep the amenity tickets from a previous flight. I'm thankful I did. It was kind of so-so, but it's fine. I'm thankful, especially I did keep the, the pajamas because they offered me in the first flight, I didn't put them on. But on the second flight, since it was a day flight, they didn't have any. For a flight that because long? Because that second flight leaves at 2.30 p.m. Uh, Frankfurt time. And they didn't have any. They said, and so I had mine from the previous flight. So it was great. But I, was, I felt kind of, a, mm, I mean, first class, even you should have them anyway, even if it's a full day flight. Because And also that know, flight is so kind of, long. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know, 12, yeah. 12 hours, was it? Yeah. Odd. Anyway, did it. it did odd, but I had mine from the previous one, so it turned out okay. Um, yeah, so really, like, you could see the crew there was, like, I mean, that's one of the best servers I ever had. Like, super energetic, super there all the time. It felt, honestly, that uh, I had 22 crew and one sommelier just for wow. me. I mean, I was like, the hell is going on? Like, every single plate, when I... I said, you know, of course, when I saw that menu, I'm like, I was not really hungry. We're like, come on, all. I'm going to eat before I'm sleeping, right? So with overeating, I'll probably go to sleep easier or something <laughs> kind of excuses we give ourselves. Uh, 
every single item it felt on the when they you know when they arranged you know they opened this huge table and they put like the all the stuff it was done by different people it was like as if everyone was there was a, a fork specialist and a knife specialist and a salt and pepper <laughs> specialist it was like and then every single plate when the plates were coming in was given by someone else. And yes, there was a sommelier. That was not a joke, by the way. There was an actual sommelier who was uh, g- giving you advice. There was uh, seven pages of, of red wine. Seven pages of red wine. And I had like a choice of at least, I don't remember, five, six different champagne of each color. I'm like, what the hell? Wow. I mean, <laughs> it's great. I mean, you see why that they can command the kind of prices, even though, again, this is the old one, but that, the service, it was... <laughs> Ah, yeah, a deta- I remember. Every time they brought you a plate, you know, let's say the plate was slightly bigger. The, you know, the, these kind of little spotlights you have uh, to for yeah. reading lights, for instance. She or he would direct the light correctly so that it would be perfectly You're on the plate. That it, it would look. It's <laughs> details, right? It's, yes. Uh, I mean, honestly, this is amazing. I was like, what the hell? I mean. I'll come to other experiences in the next episodes, guys. I've done Cathay Pacific first, and I've done the Emirates, the new seat first. But that attention to detail was kind of, I think that was unmatched. It was clearly completely over the top. I guess, again, you pay for that kind of money, but I was like, what the hell is happening? You could feel a transition, however, to a newer product, as in they were preparing probably for the newer 380 with the newer seats, because you could feel, for instance, that the, the... the glasses were clearly brand new, and they didn't exactly fit the hole that was pre-made from that seat. So they they were kind of sometimes like, oh, we're sorry. And like you could feel that it was a. Tr- it didn't matter, by the way, right? I'm just. It, it it didn't really matter, but it, it it is yeah that the food was obviously fantastic. You would have loved it, Alex. That that was one of the best food I've ever had. Um, Ah, yeah. So, net to the seat, because that's the last bit before we close the show. Because that's the most incredible seat I've ever seen in terms of... I would qualify it in one word, steampunk. Really? So, it's the most over-engineered seat I have ever seen in my life. So, it's a full cabin. Again, it's like a small room with your doors, like, full to ceiling. So, it's really wide and open, even though, you know, I'm the curvature. I mean, lower deck of the 3 t there's no much curvature, but, like, really big. There's storage a bit everywhere. It's over-engineered, like, there's a little bit of storage. The one storage I really enjoyed, and I'm sure you will actually find it smart. There was one storage that was a trash bin. Uh. And I'm like, why on earth... No single airline has, you know, you know when you have like extra plastic when you just did something, you don't know yeah. where you put it, or you have all these little things. And there was one next to you on, uh, I think it, for me it was on my right and open, and it was like, of course it was, um, there was a, that a makes trash can, sense. a little bit, but, and they will keep, you know, changing the little trash bin. So it was uh, really, I mean, that's, that's nice thinking, because genius. so many times I don't know where to put all this stuff, right? So I said the seat, so there's an Ottoman and everything, and I'm like, okay, I want to sleep. So, again, the seat is really comfy. The buttons were a bit old, but again, you know, old, but really nice. I said, I want to sleep. So, and you need to stand, of course, because they make you bed that they do in this thing. And then I'm like, there was a system of poly and cords and like, <laughs> ee, ee, ee. And I'm kidding. Of course, I'm exaggerating, but the whole, the seat disappears. So, the, the, the console next to the window, they press on it. It goes under for some reason. The seat itself folds against the wall in two bits. So, the entire console is, is pushed down, locks down. The seat folds. The ottoman kind of folds in a weird way. <laughs> Honestly, it's really bizarre. And then they open the back of the seat. The suite. I thought it was a wall. It's not a wall. It's where the the, the bed is actually. So the, the your seat is not the bed. It's a separate oh. item that suddenly comes off the wall, unfolds in two bits above the console. Uh, <laughs> very fucking weird. Above the console, they had to put like, uh, of course, in the in the middle of the, the the bed because it's a twofold. They had to put a special um, leg to put it to the ground of the cabin. It took them. Nine minutes, wow. and you could feel the whole thing, you know, clunk, 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 click, clunk. And I was like, how many things did they need to do before simply this, the, the bed is open, before even they try to put, you know, mm. beddings on it? It's, but 
Yeah, it's fun to watch. It's clearly over-engineered, like over, over-engineered. Uh, it's a bit stiff, but it's fine. But it's just over -engineered. And watching the same happen in reverse is even funner when they, about upon landing to Singapore, they, <laughs> they try to redo that in the other direction. And you're like, what? It's even, you see the clunks are even stronger. And yeah, so I loved it. It was a great seat. It's a fantastic experience. One of my best, obviously, for a super long flight. I'm not going to to, uh, to say anything negative, but I mean steampunk seats. I've never seen like Jules Verne type of levers and pulleys and it, I yeah. But fantastic experience. It's really nothing negative. Just so fun. I've never seen anything like this in the seat so yeah it's um yeah it's it, it's super fun i broke the seat <laughs> by the way when i was <laughs> when when we were about to land to singapore it wouldn't you know go back to its um uh, upright position so that's the seat not the bed the bed was gone already back where it's hidden <laughs> somewhere and um they I, I always remember because suddenly the head of cabin comes with whom i had met of course because he came to introduce himself at the beginning and the other was struggling to make it work. And you can see the guy's like, please stand up. Goes, like, puts his hand under the seat, opens slightly the seat, and there's, like, a few, like, um, it, it felt like 1960s levers. It does, tuck, 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 tuck. 30 seconds done, it would work. It works in his... And the other flight attendant who was not the cabin says, you need experience. And I'm like, yeah, that's why he's the head of the mm. cabin. <laughs> the thing was done in 30 seconds. You know, with a lot of um, this... What I love about Asia is this um, assertive attitude. I'm going to fix it. It took 30 seconds. It was fixed. It was done. It was really wow. fantastic. Anyway, that was Sounds fun. Sounds incredible. Uh, Very envious. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was really, really fun. Really, really fun. I'm going to do other flights. So we didn't have an airport because we're reaching two hours just right now. So I'm not going to do an airport. So how should we call this episode? 109 what? Mm. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> because I cannot call it Singapore because we haven't declared... Mm. What do you want to call it? Whatever the code for oh. functional code for a diversion is, we'll have to figure that out. Okay, I'm gonna call it 109 diversion. It's actually yeah, because now with the new design of the logo, I can do whatever I want in terms of uh, there's no more space limit in terms of what I can write. Before I had to really write three letters, and that was it. My previous logo, so now I can do whatever. So uh, to take us out. Do you have any flights within the next two to three weeks where we might again uh, record? Or you uh, not in the next? Maybe. Yes, actually, two weeks today. Ah, two weeks Sorry, today. What? Where are you going? Uh, again, I'm going US? to the U Yeah, it's the only place I can go. Okay, good. So you will. I'm taking tell taking us my mother to go and see her oh, granddaughter wow. for the first time since she was oh, born that, oh. nearly a year and a half ago. Okay, so that's. That's yeah. one. My mom's not uh, wow. wild about all the new protocols, and so I promised her that I would take her. At least for us, it means that the good thing is that every two weeks we'll have a new iteration of Alex Travels to see how the, uh, an entry to the US and an entry back to the UK is changing. And at some point, that will trigger me to say, okay, now I can fly because he tells me he validated the entire process, so I can, uh, I can do it. Right? Yes, I'm happy to be the guinea pig. <laughs> there you go. Look, man. See you next time. A little bit of music Love to it. get out. And um, guys, happy travels. Is it what you say? Safe saying, travels, you, happy you travels, out? all of the above. Be well, be healthy, look after each other. Don't get diverted. Don't get diverted. <laughs>is a, a minute long so we need to wait until i can stop yeah people you can hear that this is me trick telling alex how long is the song because he has no idea <laughs>